Are you an investigative professional? Have you heard about the investigatorstoolbox.com? Check out this exclusive online community for networking, learning, and data resource management. The Toolbox is a one-stop shop for all your investigative needs. Check out our robust collection of forums, our comprehensive learning page, and our expansive library of OSINT research tools. We've just released an app for both iOS and Android, so you can access the site seamlessly right off your phone. We have also partnered with some amazing companies like Crosstracks, Delpoint, IRB, ScopeNow, the Hetherington Group, PI Magazine, PI Gear, Merlin Locate Services, Parabin, the PI Institute of Education, and so many more. They're offering over $1,250 worth of discounts and benefits exclusively to community members today. Use code PIP201836 and save 10% on your membership. That's www.investigators-toolbox.com. Cross tracks case management system. That is what we are talking about today. Are you using a case management system? What are you waiting for? If you don't use a case management system, you really need to look into implementing that into your business regimen. I've been at it with cross tracks now a little over a year, and it's just been a game changer for my business. They are SOC 2 certified, SOC 2 Type 2 certified. If you don't know what that means, it means that they're encryption system is second to none and you have to go through a whole screening process to figure out uh, if you can even qualify for that and they have so you know with certainty your data is being protected i don't think there's another case management system out there that offers that same ability to have the SOC 2 type 2 certification as you guys know i've been uh, you know singing the praises of cross tracks and uh, i really believe in this product and i believe you should check it out Contact Brad, contact Pat, uh, one of the team members over there, and see if it's right for you. Cross Tracks Case Management System, check it out today. Are you overwhelmed with your current case log? Could you use some help with your skip trace assignments? With Merlin Locate Services, rather than adding staff, you can add an entire skip trace department of licensed private investigators who specialize in skip tracing. Check out MerlinLocate.com today. When you work with Merlin Locate Services, you bring on a valuable experience and trusted extension to your team. Welcome to this week's episode. We have a very special guest this week. Reform hacker, super lawyer, and all-around good guy, Alex Herbellis joins the program. We're talking everything cyber today. It's a hefty episode, but worth it. So let's jump right in. Please welcome Alex Urbelis and your host, private investigator, Matt Spare. Welcome everybody to this week's episode of PI Perspectives. This is Matt Spare, your host. Today, uh, we are in soggy New York, uh, still surviving from the remnants of Ida. Uh, it was uh, been a wild week and uh, we got a wild guest with the wild week. So I'm, I'm welcoming Alex Urbelis to the program. Alex, how are you? Hey, I'm great. And it's great to be here, Matt. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I met you a couple of years ago with the Society of Professional Investigators. You came in and you gave a chat. And uh, I, I don't even think in it, I, it was probably about 20 or 30 minutes that you, you spoke. But I don't even think people really understood how awesome the things are <laughs> that you do. Uh, I was blown away, man. I was like, oh, wow, this is really, really cool. So you are like a cyber guy. You work for a company called Kroll and Mooring. And it's no, it's not the Kroll from, uh, you know, that everybody knows it's not Julius's company. Uh, That's right. It's uh, spelled completely different, right? C-R-O-L-E-L-L, -L -L, right? Yeah, C-R-O-W-E-L-L -L and Mooring. So Kroll and Mooring, we're a, we're a big international law firm. In it, and I've recently joined Kroll after running my own shop for uh, about the last six years. Yeah, yeah. And that recently, right? A couple months ago. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. So you have a very extensive background in cyber. Uh, you're an attorney also, right? Uh, as that's well right. As, uh, entrepreneur, lawyer, businessman, so you name it. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. I'm, I'm senior counsel in the cybersecurity and privacy practice group over at Kroll and Mooring. Yeah. Uh, but that obviously it involves a lot of in, investigative work uh, on my end as well. Right. So how did you get into all this? What's your background? Well, uh, it's an interesting story. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, in in large part, um, you know, my career has been propelled by uh, by my misspent youth. 
really as a hacker. And so, you know, going from hacker to lawyer, I think a lot of people could possibly accuse me of going from bad to worse. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but curiously uh, enough, though, it, it really was this this misspent youth of mine that has that has defined the trajectory of my legal career. And and I really still maintain my connections with the the hacker community. And, and that community has morphed or, or perhaps maybe um, overlapped, I think is a better word. Right. with the cybersecurity community for some time now. And, and having this hacker background, this hacker mentality, and being one of the good guys, uh, it's really opened up a lot of doors for me. I found myself uh, working in places that the 15-year-old the hacker me would have never expected right. <laughs> in a million years. Um, right. uh, I worked for the U.S. Army JAG Corps on privacy issues. Uh, as a civilian, I worked at a uh, federally funded think tank at Dartmouth College while I was in law school called the Institute for Security Technology Studies. And, and I focused on counterterrorism and uh, cybersecurity issues there. And then that led me to CIA mm -hmm. in the uh, Office of General Counsel. Then I had clerked for the chief judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. We were like the Supreme Court of the military. Yeah. Uh, from there, I, I had to make a decision about whether I stuck with the government or went into private practice at that point. And I, I took the money and went over to Steptoe and Johnson right. in uh, D.C. I was in the D.C. office at first. Then I, uh, I went uh, on a leave of absence from Steptoe, did another law degree overseas in England, uh, in the UK at Oxford, right. uh, and then came back to the New York office of Steptoe, left there after about six years, seven years, uh, to Richmond, which is uh, a luxury conglomerate uh, that owns Cartier, Piaget, Montblanc, Chloe, about 22 very big luxury brands. They were the, the second biggest luxury conglomerate on, on the planet, the first one being uh, LVMH. And I was uh, in-house cybersecurity counsel and then was promoted uh, to the chief compliance officer of the organization. Wow. Uh, I then left that. I uh, was living in London for a while, for a couple of years doing that gig, and then moved back to New York, started my own firm where I really wanted to marry the practice of law with the practice of information security and tying that all together with these investigative techniques that I that I know and understand as, as somebody who used to be a hacker. Uh, and one of the things I did there too was create a very unique cybersecurity threat intelligence platform that allows me to track uh, advanced cyber adversaries. Right. And so while I was there, I also went on uh, secondment from uh, the end of October 2019 through the, I guess, just to, to about the mid of, uh, middle of 2020. And I was the acting chief information security officer of the NFL, the national football league. Yes. And, um, and it, and it was great. And I overlapped, uh, bringing on with the, while well, they brought on the permanent CISO and wound up sticking around a lot longer than I had thought. And, um, and then very recently, about a month and a half ago, moved over to Kroll and Mooring as senior counsel for cybersecurity. So it's been an interesting ride, but it really has all been propelled by this hacker background. So let me ask you a question then. When you see these Hollywood movies, do you yell at the television and go like, no, no, that's wrong. That's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I do. <laughs> and there, you know, it, it's amazing. It's funny you say that because, you know, years ago, I actually put together, um, you know, the, the early stages of something that would debunk all of these Hollywood hacker simulation movies and, and show how really those types of hacks could, could have happened. But I think, you know, it was probably a little bit too early for people to be interested in that kind of thing on, on television. Yeah. Um, but, and then you have, you know, something like Mr. Robot that comes along where there's a lot of, you know, it, there, there's a lot of reality to, you know, the exploits that are shown on, on that show. And I think that one is a real sea change when it came to, to making the real world of, of hacking more accessible to the populace and, so, and interesting to, to audiences. Yeah. Uh, it, it, 
it's really interesting. I mean, you can go all the way back to like war games, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. really, that's probably like the beginning of, you know, the the dial up there of the <laughs> the modem, right? That's right. I mean, he was using a a three hundred baud modem with an acoustic coupler, plugging the phone into it, right? But right. war games was great too because it it had um, a level of it was about hacking, but they also incorporated some phone freaking into that as well. Do you remember the the scene where he makes the free phone calls using? Uh, the you know I don't know what are those things called on on a can of soda right that you've you oh, the tabs like the, yeah. the yep. tabs yeah using the tab of a coin unscrewing the receiver touching something to it creating some impedance I mean yeah War, War Games was great it's uh, probably ready for a reboot yeah I can see it right you, you should definitely put a script out there <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, one of these days right I think it could be yeah. like your life story right <laughs> yeah that, that, that it would be. <laughs> it would be interesting I mean especially today too because you know war games uh, you know and, and what they were doing in the original war games was you know, a lot about artificial intelligence to yeah. a certain extent right and the simulation of these types of, of war games right I mean, that's yeah. where the the uh, the name came from. Yeah, I, I think that the thing that that freaks me out the most now these days is all the deep fake stuff with videos. Yes. Like, you think thinking of someone who's like, you know, lives and breathes in, in the law venue, right? It's personal injury cases and things like that. Oh, we've got the video, you know, it's like, that freaks me out, you know, when they start questioning, you know, are you looking at what you really are looking at that? I, to me, uh, I, I think that that'll give me nightmares for a long time. Yeah. And the deep fakes, you know, they're, they are, I think they're getting better. They're getting faster. It's, it's getting cheaper to make these types of deep fakes. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we very often forget is that, um, you know, we're concerned about our own elections, election interference, misinformation, insurrections, things like that. But the proving grounds for the, this type of malicious activity from an advanced cyber adversary are, is very often going to be developing democracies or developing economies, countries that don't necessarily have a, a very stable democracy. Right. And and having a, a deep fake kind of run wild in, let's say, you know, a, a West African country it can really prove, you know, how effective it can be. And I think that that's where, you know, we as not only as investigators, but cybersecurity uh, practitioners um, and intelligence gatherers, collectors, you know, really need to be looking out for uh, additional activity with respect to deep fakes, because that's where all of these things are going to be proven before they make their way into, you know, the, the political spectrum of the United States. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I think you, you bring up some good points there. And we're, we're gonna, we're gonna dig into that whole cybersecurity stuff and, and really push forward after we come back from from the break. But I, I want to uh, lay a little more foundation on you. I mean, obviously, you've got uh, your pedigree, I don't think anyone can argue with it. But uh, what was the first computer you had? Oh my God! I had uh, that's a good question. I had an XT. I mean, uh, that ran at four megahertz. Uh, I mean, I mean, you could literally see you know the processor spinning at that point. It was so <laughs> it was, slow. Was there a mouse <laughs> in the back on the wheel? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, it was an XT. It was probably 1994, 1993, something around that time. So an XT uh, at that point was already extraordinarily dated and obsolete. I mean, this was, you know, really all, all we could afford back in the day. I mean, I came from my, uh, really a, a single parent household. We couldn't afford a computer. I got my hands on this, this old XT ran at four megahertz, had a 30 megabyte hard drive mm -hmm. that, um, was gigantic. I mean, it was, you know, probably about six inches high, yeah. you know, it was heavy and it, and it held 30 megs. Yeah. Uh, that's it. It also had zero Ram. Uh, only 640k conventional memory built onto the motherboard and this is something that you know we all forget that you know bill gates way back in the day said you know no computers are ever going to need more than 640k of conventional memory now i mean look at this the, the machine that i'm on right now talking to you has got 32 gigs of ram on it uh, i mean it's un unfathomable to me and and you know my my 14 year old self right <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, but i love that machine i loved it it had a cga monitor you know it wasn't even a vga monitor it had you know i think 32 colors that it could nice. display nice but uh well, i got I'm a 2400 watt modem I'm going to wow you even further, right? So I'm, I'm, Go I, got a, I got a few years on you, right? I'm a little bit older. So, uh, 
<clears throat> my parents, I, I, all my friends were getting Ataris. They were getting Commodores and all that. My parents bought me a Texas Instruments because, you know, they make calculators and, you know, yep. science and whatever. And, you know, uh, that was the computer that I was allowed to get. And those, the games that went along with it, you know, I literally had a, had a cassette tape that I had to put into a cassette player that I hooked up to. Oh, the my computer. God. Yep. And it would take 10 minutes to load a game up. Right. Amazing. So <clears throat> they had this game. It was called Parsec. And I was really good at it. I could play this thing without the joystick. I had the whole keyboard thing going. And I remember uh, my my dad took me to Caldors just to go shopping one day. And they had the Texas Instrument there on display with Parsec. And I started playing the game and I swear it was like one of these movies where there's like a crowd of people coming around you. And I had like the all time high score in this thing. I was oh like the world, the world champion of the world of Parsec, you know? And, and my dad was bragging. He's like, yeah, he's not even using the joystick. Look at this kid. He's amazing. So. That's, that's amazing. Hey, yeah. uh, you, you mentioned something. I'll, I'll tell you a very quick anecdote because you mentioned Caldor, right? So Caldor's, if you want to talk about kind of old school, right. uh, we did some crazy things with Caldors way back in the day. Um, you know, when I was in high school, like, so I had a friend of mine who worked at Caldor, you know, and they, they since went out of business, yeah. but they had, um, you know, we were always looking for external links into the internal phone systems of companies back in the day as, as phone freaks. So that we figured out the Caldor phone number, we were scanning around <laughs> and we, we got, you know, we we're looking for maybe a carrier or some kind of modem that would pick up, right. you know, or, a dial tone because to the untrained ear, the dial tone, you know, sounds like the phone hung up, but we right. knew as phone freaks that this was the external link into the internal Caldor phone system. It was their PBX, right? So we needed to have a four digit code that we could find to get us into this PBX. And we tried for a while. And then one night my buddy and I were on the line on a three-way call trying to get into this thing. And he said to me, and he worked at Caldor, by the way. So he said to me, try 2253. I said, okay, what's that? He said, well, it spells C-A-L-D on the phone. I said, well, why didn't we try that before? Boom, <laughs> let's <laughs> just write in, right? So so then we're inside the internal phone system of Caldor, which we would ordinarily, back in the 90s, try to find a way to dial out, right? right. So that you, know, you could call other computer bulletin boards, something like that. Uh, and, and not pay the long distance charges. But right. since he worked there, he knew all of the codes to route your phone calls and things. And so if he was working the till, uh, I could literally ring him on the phone while he was right there. But more importantly, we could dial this phone number from anywhere in the world, put in 2253, that would allow us to the internal phone system and then dial 73 and it would transfer our call over to the entire store's PA system. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, you can imagine the havoc yeah. that was wreaked on that particular <laughs> store, you know, by a bunch of teenagers who had complete control over the PA system. Oh I mean, God. this is yeah. like an air airplane movie. I mean, just, <laughs> yeah, it really, it really, really was. I mean, we used oh, to the white phone. <laughs> oh yeah. We used to, you know, announce that the store was closing early. You know, I read the entire first page of a clockwork orange over the, uh, over the loudspeakers. You know, there was me. That is Alex and my three droogs. That is Pete Georgian. So we, we had a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, but so you put them out of business, essentially. They're, they're, they're bankrupt. <laughs> well, Caldor did su subsequently go out of business. I don't know if there was a proximate connection no, no correlation the two of them but uh could be you know one of those logical fallacies uh, associated with causation post hoc ergo propter hoc right okay. after this therefore on account of it but um but the funny thing was so every single caldor had the same type of pbx system that right. if you found their phone system if you found their telephone number uh you could scan around within five minutes find it and they had the same code for every single PBX. Wow. I mean, and, uh, that's just where, you know, security right there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, things have certainly evolved over the last, you know, 25 years or so, right. but, you know, default passcodes and default accounts uh, and things like that are, are still very big problems. Yeah. I, I think uh, it's space balls, right? It, it, you know, giving the code one, two, three, four, five, six. That, that's, that's right. The, that's the code of my <laughs> luggage, you know, <laughs> that's right. note to self change code for luggage. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of good quotes from space balls. I have <laughs> to say, you know? so before we take the break, I got one important question. Um, and then we'll, we'll get into the technical stuff when we come back. How do you, how do you, um, turn into a white knight? What, what was the point in your life when you're doing this hacking stuff? And then all of a sudden you said, you know what, 
I need to switch to, to sides. What, what, walk me through that. Yeah. I mean, I think to, to a large extent, you know, I would always been, uh, you know, one, one of the good guys, I was never one of the, the bad hackers, right. In the sense that, um, you know, I, I never did anything too malicious. I was always you know, more concerned with learning, figuring out how systems worked, you know, right. taking things apart and, and not being afraid to ask certain types of questions. And so I felt like I was always one of the good guys to a certain extent. But then I think, you know, and, and it may sound, uh, you know, really dramatic, but I, I think September 11th was a very big change for me as well. You know, having been in New York on September 11th and yeah. was out on, I was actually, I was out on Long Island that day uh, and supposed to come in to New, the city that, that very night. And then shortly thereafter, I went to law school and, and I changed my focus quite a bit and, and really wanted to help out the country. Yeah. And that was when I started working for, or being interested in working for the government uh, and and it was almost like I was being inexorably propelled towards these things because these opportunities just kept opening up for me. Yeah. You know, it, it was um, it, it felt almost surreal because there were very, very few people who understood the technology, the fundamentals of the technology, understood the mentalities of, of hackers, uh, understood, uh, you know, the, the things like advanced encryption techniques. Uh, and we're becoming lawyers. And so it opened up having that background and having that mentality opened up a lot of doors for me. And it also, I think, um, being, being a hacker gave me a lot of intellectual confidence, sure. uh, you know, it, it, to, to do well, not only in, in college, but in, in law school, because you would use these sort of a fortiori arguments that, you know, is what we call them in the law or by necessary implication, right? So if I can do all of these crazy things with computers, if I can understand assembly, if I can, you know, hack a Linux system and program in C or something like that, you know, then I should be able to you know, get an A in social studies. Oh, That's go. easy, right? I mean, these, are, these are sort of, you know, the, the easy things. But frankly, though, I, I, I think it, it goes back to you know what it is to to be a hacker and and to me i think you know being a hacker is really less about technical skills and more about having a mindset and perhaps even a, a certain sort of philosophical outlook akin to maintaining almost a um childlike attitude towards the world and sure. and being a hacker i think is is about you know being afraid like i said to to take things apart uh, ask questions, yeah. uh, never being afraid to ask questions. You know, I, uh, an old mentor of mine used to say, you know, there, there are no dumb questions, you know, but there are a lot of inquisitive idiots. Right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so there, you know, there, awesome. there's that, right. right. Um, so it, it, it's also about, you know, learning systems and processes and finding the vulnerabilities in those systems and processes. And, and I think it's for this reason that I really believe that the best lawyers out there have this type of mindset and the best lawyers are hackers, even though they might not actually know it. Yeah. They, I mean, listen, when you put it that way, you're, you're right, right? Questioning things, um, you know, that, that, that just push for the truth of just trying to understand why something happened and considering all possibilities. That was like a game changer for me when I took the LSATs to start to prepare to, to essentially become a lawyer. And then at the last minute said, ah, I don't want to do this, but I still yeah, prepared, I understand right? that. you yep. know? And for me, it was that, that light bulb went out for me sitting in the Bronx courthouse um, on a motion call and then going to the clerk's office to file some papers and seeing 20 or 30 people in front of me waiting on line that looked miserable. And I was like, wow, yeah. is that going to be me in, in 10 years? I don't want this. You know? Yeah. So. Oh yeah. I mean, and that's state court for you to a, to a large extent, right? I mean, it's just a parade of bad suits you know, right. in, in state court and, you know, and, and, you know, for that reason, I try to stay out of uh, New York state courts. It can just really be a, you know, it can bog you down. Well, in a lot of ways, um, I tell you, I tell you what, though, yeah, different. federal's crazy. That's a whole nother yeah. animal. I'm right there with you. But yep. I tell you, though, state court is a great place to practice social engineering. Right. I, yes, <laughs> so, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> really, uh, no doubt. You can learn how to make friends and really play the Jedi mind trick on people if, you know, if you're bored. And, and that's what I did. 
you know, yeah, and I learned how to make the, the clerks my best friends there. Um, so uh, essentially out of boredom, <laughs> so I wouldn't have to wait online. And, oh, exactly. I mean, and, you know, certain tricks too, you know, like if you want to file something, you know, don't don't dress like an attorney, don't wear a suit, things like that. You know, they love to give attorneys hard time, send you oh, back absolutely. to the office in you know, it, it's it, it absolutely it's it's such a crazy, crazy system to deal with the New York state courts. I think a, any state court system to an extent yeah. where you have an overly litigious population, uh, you know, like, yeah. like most of the United States, I think is going to be very, very similar to New York. Right, right, right. OK, so this is a good spot to take a break. So we're going to jump out and take a break. And when we come back, uh, I really want to jump into cybersecurity, cyberbullying. I want to talk about the role of, of like how an investigator can uh, implement some services and some things that, you know, your expertise and really understand that there, there are avenues that you can do. Because I, I myself have contacted you several times on on cases I needed assistance with. And, and that's really what it comes down to. So everybody sit tight and we'll be right back. Are you a member of NCISS? Were you affected by Hurricane Ida? NCISS has established a disaster relief fund for its members. You can discreetly apply for aid if you need it. Visit NCISS.org to learn more. I want to talk to everybody today about ScopeNow.com. ScopeNow has been a big time sponsor of this program for quite some time. And I just love their service. I've been using them since the beginning. I'm one of their beta customers and uh, it's been so awesome to see them grow into the business that they are today and just how they just keep reinventing themselves and pushing themselves to get more and more information. What it comes down to is, is Scope Now is a tool that you definitely need to use if you do social media investigations, any internet research, and really spending less time digging around and, and uh, looking for information. I think it's one of the best points of how ScopeNow can help you. Their AI platform, their analytics are amazing. You really get an idea of what you need. You're reducing the time, you're reducing the manpower that you, you're spending on doing this research because they're essentially doing it for you and uh, they're doing it correctly, which is most important. One of the new things that they're actually offering is this flagging system where you can flag behaviors and really highlight and um, look out for fraud. If you're doing a lot of fraud research, uh, this is a fantastic tool and you can set up alerts so you have uh, particular people that you're looking at you can actually set up alerts to get notifications when the criteria that you set up is actually um, is flagged and goes off it's really uh, really amazing and their relationship and association analytics are uh, top notch really uh, cutting edge and really really cool when they brought that out on version 3 it was a game changer. I mean, really being able to see how people interact together and, and uh, you know, having that relationship, you know, analysis is really, really something that's cool. You know, one of the other things about being involved with Scope Now is their ability to offer webinars. Their team is cutting edge on putting together and getting out really, really great content. If you're a member of Scope Now, if you know who they are, you've seen them around on LinkedIn, you'll, you'll know that they're constantly doing webinars on these new websites that are coming out and uh, they're, they're really staying on top of it. And don't forget, uh, any reports that you generate, you can actually white label those reports and put your own logos on and, and really make them look professional, which you know could equate to more billing for you as well. So check them out today. It's uh, www.scopenow.com. They're a great, great company. They should be one of the tools in your toolbox, along with whatever kind of uh, search engines you do. Uh, you need to make sure that ScopeNow is a part of that suite. ScopeNow.com. Need the best insurance coverage out there? Check out SIIS Insurance. Make your insurance purchasing process a breeze by dealing with the leading PI industry experts. All filings for your state PI license are handled directly by their staff. Certificates of coverage to your clients are fulfilled the same day as requested. If you work armed, no worries as they always include firearms liability in their coverage. Coverage can be expanded to cover executive protection, consulting liability, guard operations, and for cyber liability inexpensively. Best of all, be sure to indicate on the application that you're a regular PI prospective listener or Investigator Toolbox subscriber as amazing discounts apply. So make sure you take advantage today. Visit Security Investigators Insurance Solution, SIISinsurance.com. 
In 2019, Investigation Education Consultants added a new affiliate in its never-ending quest to provide quality professional investigative training. IEC is now offering certificate courses and investigative training online. Our website, IECOIT.com, will soon offer a certificate in professional investigation for those interested in entering the investigative field. There'll be standalone investigation classes for those seeking continuing education credits, CEUs, or just interested in taking classes for their own personal or professional interests. The classes currently available are Foundations of Investigation, Legal Investigation, Criminal Investigation, Fraud Investigation, Background Investigation, Interviews and Statements, Skip Tracing Locates, Ethics, and Report Writing. Investigator Toolbox members will receive a 20% discount off the listed price. So visit IECOIT.com. Are you a member of NCISS? Do you know what this great organization does? The National Council of Investigation and Security Services was formed in 1975 to keep a watchful eye on legislation that affects our industry. Now more than ever, there are data privacy and DMV issues popping up all over the country. Consider joining and supporting this much-needed watchdog for our industry. Learn more at NCISS.org. The surveillance issue of PI Magazine is here. Make sure you check out all the great content available in this special edition. Get it online or via hard copy. And welcome back to PI Perspectives. This is Matt Sperry, your host. Today, we're joined by Alex Rebellis uh, in New York City uh, with Kroll and Mooring. Alex, welcome back to the program. Only a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Matt. Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, I feel like we're we're having a lot of fun here. Uh, yes. We're, we're re- reliving our youths <laughs> prior to That's getting right. into this. Misspent youth. Yeah. Misspent, yes. And <laughs> we, we were just uh, talking offline about Statue of Limitations. So uh, we're going to move on. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's right. So uh, before uh, we took the break, I teased about um, uh, talking about uh, how a private investigator or someone who does research, investigative research, uh, can use your services, the type of uh, things that you um, do. Um, so we're focusing on cybersecurity and bullying and, and things like that. So walk me through uh, the type of services that uh, that you do. Yeah, sure. I mean, on the investigative side, you know, uh, I do a lot of unmasking anonymous threat actors on on the internet, right? So let, let's take it back to you know, a personal level, right? So if there is cyber stalking, if there is some kind of cyber bullying, you know, what I can often do is piece together the various, you know, puzzle pieces that we have that we know about, and then use legal process to acquire additional evidence, Mm -hmm. you know, with respect to that investigation that let's say only law enforcement could have had uh, access to. And as, as we all know, it can be very, very difficult to get the police or especially any kind of federal law enforcement agent involved in, in an investigation unless there is you know, a, an imminent threat or an extraordinarily large sum of money at right. issue that, that had been stolen. And so what I can do is, you know, let's say an example is you know, somebody using some kind of burner telephone number or an anonymous email address to send something like, uh, you know, death threats, harassing information, or revenge porn. All uh, started on MySpace, right? The the one yeah. gal who, whose mother like uh, had the account telling the other girl she should go kill herself, and she killed herself, right? That, that's right. I mean, there's there's so many of these tragedies that have that have happened, you know, since then as well. And and, and having kids myself, you know, cyberbullying, you know. You, you, you worry about it all the time and the psychological effect that it can have on children. And so (laughs) yeah, we're the the worst. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, they, they, we really are. I, 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 you know, I can't argue with that. That's, that's, that's absolutely the case. But so there's always a a point at which I think an investigator needs to get information from a third party and you can't get it yourself and you can't just ask for it. If you ask for it, They'll say, well, you know, service with legal process, service with a subpoena. If you look at any of these terms of service or terms of use, uh, you know, your end user license agreements, your EULAs, they all reference the fact that, you know, they will hand over data, but only on the basis of receiving legal process. Right. And so, so what does that mean? Right? Yeah, it's got yeah, to be. It, it can be too, right? And so uh, what, what this really means is, you know, you need a lawyer to serve a subpoena. 
but a lawyer just can't willy-nilly serve a subpoena. You need to have an active case. Mm -hmm. And so that means that you need to, to file a case either in state court or federal court. Uh, and going back to the you know the discussion we had, you know, we tr tr definitely try to stay out of state court for these types of things because you can usually always make some kind of jurisdictional argument to get into federal court, whether it's on the basis of, of federal question jurisdiction, which right. would be about um, the violation of a, of a federal statute, like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in, in a lot of uh, incident response scenarios, if we're going to use legal process to obtain additional evidence, uh, in, incident response from some kind of cyber attack or some kind of breach. Right. Um, you know, that's, what, that's a, certainly a jurisdictional hook that we would use. Um, you know, and others could be like, you know, a violation of the wiretap statute, something like that, or uh, trade secret misappropriation will now also uh, bounce you into federal court, uh, as well as diversity jurisdictions. A lot of times here, you are seeking information about a defendant uh, whom, or rather whose identity you do not know. And right. so you may reasonably be able to assume diversity of the parties. And if there is in diversity in this situation, uh, is not, you know, the kind of critical race theory diversity that we're hearing about, you know, in the news, but it's a legal term of art that just means that uh, the people on the different sides of the V in the lawsuit, the plaintiff and the defendant are from different states. Right. As you go back to the to the 18th century when the federal judiciary was created, there was an assumption that the state courts would favor uh, their own citizens. And so the federal courts were made available to decide disputes between uh, citizens of different states. And that, that basis of jurisdiction still maintains today and is great to use when we are investigating anything that require, that has some kind of cyber component to it, cyber bullying, cyber stalking, sure. um, cyber security breaches as well. I feel like you probably have a reputation in federal court as well, right? So it's easier for you because you're 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 essentially um, uh, being heard in front of the same people. I would I would guess, right? Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that that's right. You know, you get to know the judges, especially in the Southern District, and I think there's a very high expectation uh, when it comes to the caliber of practice that you have in front of these judges. You know, you don't want to just go with a, a, a any old lawyer or somebody that would, you know, is going to be focusing really on, on state court matters rather, and then go into federal court and expect them to get this type of uh, uh, treatment. Because, you know, you're, you're asking the judge, essentially, once you file this case, let's say, and a lot of times you can file these cases under seal, mm -hmm. um, or, uh, you can have both the, the plaintiff and the defendant uh, known as John Doe's or Jane Doe's, Victor Vose, John Doe's, you know, depending upon the, the, you know, the facts leading up to this particular you know, situation or scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you can have a lot of anonymity there, but you definitely need to have the trust of the judge here because what you're asking the judge is once you file this case, then the first thing the judge is going to do, well, he's going to be assigned. Um, you're going to, to, to make your appearance. And then the judge is probably going to, to schedule something called the 26F conference under the federal rules of civil procedure. And that's an initial pretrial conference. And that's at the time where I would then write to the judge and say, your honor, we would love to have a, a, a 26F conference. However, we don't know who the defendant is at this particular time. If we're going to have a meaningful Rule 26, 26F conference, we need to identify this defendant. Right. And on the basis of the case law in the Second Circuit, there are these five factors uh, you know, that would allow you to give me subpoena power to figure out who that defendant is so that we can then amend the complaint and, and serve the defendant and get him into court and then have that 26F conference that you want to have so badly. Right. Uh, and so, so long as you know what those factors are, you figure out, you know, how the judge has, has ruled on these particular matters in the past, you're usually off to the races at that yeah. point. But it does take, you know, a, a certain amount of digging and thinking. And it also requires you to set forth one of those factors are what, what have you done already? in terms of this investigation and why is this data not available to you? So this is where working with a good PI, you know, a, a lawyer can really lean on the work that a PI has done already and say, we, we've been working with this private investigation firm. They've turned over all of these stones. 
Yeah. And now we need to start turning over stones that we can only turn over through legal process. Yeah. And I would take it a step further. Like the investigator that you're working on that should be versed on how to do open resource, right? OSINT, but they should also be versed on, on coding and GitHub and all these other tools that are available to go back door and really do the research that you need to do. So you, you need to make sure that if you're engaging in that type of research, that you're, you're up on your education, you know, you're, you're attending things like osmosis and, and doing your, the training that you need to do for that. Right. Oh, I com completely agree. Completely agree. Uh, and, and allows you to, to have a lot more credibility in front of the judge saying, you know, like we we've tried everything that we can. Um, and now it now is the time to, you know, start giving us the subpoena power because, you know, we, we've done everything that we possibly can. Yeah. Uh, and you know, your, the reputation of the, of the PI could certainly come into play there. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's, I, you had mentioned before about uh, state court attorneys going into federal court. And I uh, remember like a, an instance with, with me where I was hired to do something on a uh, federal case and uh, the attorney that was, um, Handling it didn't really have that much experience in federal court and he didn't disclose me. He didn't like properly. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. And then I remember the judge just lost his marbles and he's yelling, he's screaming at the, at, at the attorneys. Right. And I'm just like, wow. And he looks at me, he goes, you're not testifying today. I was like, okay, your honor. He goes he, to the, to the guy that, that hired me and he points and he goes, and you, he's like, yes, your honor. He goes, you're paying his, his full wage for the day. <laughs> I'm like, Wow. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> you <know? laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, it, it really depends. I mean, some judges in the in the Southern District and Federal Court are, you know, of infinite patience. Yeah. You know, and they will take so much from, from both sides before they lose their cool. Yeah. Uh, and others are very hot under the collar at the first instance of, of any sign of insubordination. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you really got to know. Uh, well, I, you I know totally your judge. I totally got the idea that this guy was making a lot of mistakes and the judge was just like, you know what, enough already. Right. And, um, yeah. you know, just bringing it into the conversation here, you're talking about, you know, folks that, that should be there or, or that know the ropes and folks that don't same thing with investigators, right? So investigators that know how to do this type of research are, are going to, they're going to give you what you need better than ones that are just kind of figuring it out. Uh, and that was a lesson I learned along the way too, because I used to do, everything I possibly could myself, but I've gotten to points now where I understand there are people out there that do it better than me, not because they're smarter than me, but that it's their wheelhouse. It's their, their, um, how they make a living. Right. And they're going to give you a better work product that, that, you know, you're just attaching yourself to smart business. Yeah. 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 It, it really is. I mean, some people are, are better at uh, other things than others. Right. And you know, you, you have to, you have to find who those experts are and work with them. I mean, like in, in your field, right? I mean, there are going to be people that focus on undercover operations, you know, and that's totally different from something like a surveillance operation, right? You're going to, you're going to have different teams. Um, and there's, there certainly is not a, a one lawyer size fits all type of mentality to these types of investigations, you know, when it comes to cyber issues. And I think this is, you know, a really good point to kind of roll into what happens next. Once you get these subpoenas and you get this information back, um, or, you know, Actually, most of the times, once you serve these subpoenas, let's say you serve them on Twitter or Facebook, wh whomever, right, or wh whichever company, uh, you're not ordinarily going to get the information back right away. They're yeah. going to throw up some kind of nonsense reason why they can't give you this information. And this is why it, it goes right to your point, Matt. You have to have uh, somebody who has the expertise to deal with these particular types of issues, yeah. because very often you're going to get a response back from, from Twitter or somebody that says that, um, you know, because of the stored communications act, uh, they're not allowed to actually produce this information that you had requested uh, via your subpoenas. Yeah. At which point you need to be able to then say to them in a responsive letter, that's absolute nonsense. Uh, the stored communications act would apply only to the content of communications. Yeah. Not necessarily to metadata. And let's say, you know, if we're talking about anonymous post or a revenge porn situation where, you know, perhaps something was uploaded to a porn site, 
uh, a non-consensual video was uploaded to a porn site or a cyber stalking type of situation, we're going to be looking for something like an IP address or associated user information, yep. a MAC address. You know, this is all not content of communications. But again, yep. it goes to knowing who your audience is and making sure that when you craft these subpoenas in the first instance, you're not seeking things that would violate the Stored Communications Act. You're not seeking really point. Yeah. The, yeah, the super, actual super messages. So yeah. I, I had a very interesting situation probably about a month or two ago uh, with the Citizen app, right? So we had uh, somebody who had captured some video on, on Citizen for an incident involving an accident that I was working on, and we were trying to get a hold of that person's information, get a hold of that the video, actually, that they actually shot. And... Um, we did the whole serve the subpoena on uh, citizen and, and we heard nothing, right? Served another one, heard nothing. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to follow up on this. And I like emailed, like I, I just started calling people and, and, and I got the, the correct email. And within a day they responded to me. I was like, it was so unusual that yeah. it actually worked. You know, I was like, wow. Okay. Yeah. That, that's amazing. And yeah. I think, you know, this is a, this is a new sort of 2020 to 2021 problem where yeah. You serve these subpoenas, but nobody's there to yeah. receive them, to to acknowledge them, and so you have to chase them down. And and you know, and that's such a good point because before you run to your lawyer and say, you know, they're ignoring us, you need to file a motion to compel the you know production. Um, that it, it that can be very expensive, you know, for the client. Yeah. Um, you're absolutely just try to follow up, make a few yeah. phone calls because it might it might be an innocent mistake. It's exactly what it was. It was like, hey man, we're so overwhelmed. Like we got it, we got it, and this and that. And I'm like, hey, do you mind if you could just take a look for this thing? And sure enough, like, like I got I hung the phone up. I was just like, what just happened? Because that never happens, <laughs> you know. Yeah. No, you're uh, and look, and you're right, and and also it's a bit of social engineering there too, right? Being nice to somebody, understanding their plight. 100%. You know, and something like the Citizen app too, which has only been around for a couple of years, they probably don't have a really well-defined law enforcement or or legal process support function in house. You know, they're probably running by the seat of their pants there in the legal so, department. So you 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 bring up a real good point because I think the intention of that serve the subpoena is for law enforcement only. It pretty much says that on there. But we were like, hey, we're going to do it anyways. And yeah, we did it, and and we got what we needed, which was totally amazing. So, yeah, it, it, <laughs> it really is. Yeah. And and like I said, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you need to push back, you need to tell them, you know, look, this is a, you know, this doesn't violate the Stored Communications Act, or it's not content or whatever. But once you set that out, you know, generally, you'll get the information back, because the way in which you, you go about doing this as well, uh, through the federal courts is that you have a you you're serving them with a subpoena that a federal judge has already had eyes on and has okayed uh, the service of, of of which that subpoena it, it, you know it has been um, pretty much uh, it, it's been reviewed and seen as reasonable under the circumstances and and a judge has authorized it so if you if you find yourself in a in a situation where there is non-compliance with that subpoena and that's unreasonable non-compliance you're really going to piss off that federal judge yeah and uh, uh and nobody wants to be in that situation so so going through you know this process and stepping through this process i think is uh you know even though it can take a little bit more time you're more likely to get the information that's relevant to your investigation Right. So let's pivot here a little bit, because I wanted to cover uh, a, a very big um, uh, situation that you were involved in recently with the World Health Organization in, in a cyber attack. And you've got this platform that you've created. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the platform and tell me about this instance, what, what happened? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that, uh, you know, I did over the last couple of years was I had, um, you know, uh, again, using the product of my misspent youth and and sort of self taught programming, you know, I, I never That's studied your limitations, buddy. Come on, <laughs> yeah, watch yourself. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, no, it's it, it's fine. It's totally fine. But you know, I had put together um, something called a, a DNS intelligence platform, or and DNS stands for the domain name system, the global domain name system. You know, like CNN.com, right? It is it is an actual is a domain name. Um, and, and you have now the expansion of the domain name system to all these new top level domains, things like instead of just having .com, .net, .org, 
which are the three most popular ones. You also have things like dot email, dot link, dot website. Okay. And back in 20, uh, from really 2010 through 2013, um, ICANN or the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which <laughs> regulates the security and stability of the internet. Thanks, Carl. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah they, uh, I mean, it's a bizarre situation. I mean, they're a little not-for-profit corporation in California. I mean, not little anymore, but um, they, they had essentially allowed the expansion of the DNS, and I was a big part of that process. And I, I think I had put in uh, or actively worked on just over 200 individual applications for top-level domains um, back in 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. So it was a massive amount of work, and I got a great deal of experience uh, working in the DNS and then also having a lot of DNS or domain name system experience from my, my hacker background. And so I built this program, or not a program, it was a platform really, um, and it's tens of thousands of lines of code now from between Bash and Python, kind of old school regular expressions, and um, where I have a huge number of uh, a huge amount of local data. And what I do is I scan that local data looking for deltas or changes between what the global domain name system looked like yesterday and what it looks like at the moment that I'm scanning it. And what I look specifically for are early stage indicators of cyber attacks on clients or companies or organizations or looking for different types of uh, conceptual indicators that something is going awry in, in the DNS. And so at a very basic level, one of the things that I'm investigating and looking for are things like uh, trademark infringement. That's the very surface level of this, right? If we're looking for names and strings, right? Strings being um, just, you know, characters, what one character after another, a string of characters, right, is, is, uh, is what we could be looking for. So let's say, you know, we're looking for something like um, Boeing, right? And it's very easy for me then to find permutations of Boeing because that's a static, there's a static number of permutations for the name Boeing. So I can find all of those things before, you know, at the point that they're registered, um, you know, let the clients know about them. Those are very often uh, early stage indicators that something bad is going to happen, especially if you look at underlying domain name system data like uh, MX records or mail server records. Those are domains, permutation domains may be used for uh, phishing attacks, credentials harvesting, et cetera. You get those credentials, you move in, make some lateral moves, find the high grade ore, then you find yourself in perhaps you know a, a ransomware situation. Right. Uh, and that's something that you, you wanna avoid. But looking for the actual domains, that's the very basic stuff. And that's more brand protection. So what I've done is, is to go uh, farther afield and deeper as well. So if you think about brand protection or just IP issues, so yeah, I can do that really easily, but from an information security standpoint, from a cybersecurity standpoint, there are a lot of black holes on the internet from which nobody can get data. Uh, and a lot of these are country code top level domains because they are not regulated by ICANN, the, the not-for-profit corporation we just referenced. Right. And so you know, these CCTLDs, as they're known, country code top level domains, these are places like .de, you know, for Germany or .us for the United States. And then somewhat more problematic, you have places like Cameroon, which is .cm, which, you know, looks a hell of a lot like .com. Sure. And, sure. you know, you're looking at a, a domain, but they don't share their their underlying data about all the domains that are in their particular top level domain. Well, Some of the things... Making oh, typos, ahead, right? I'm sorry. It's people oh. making typos, right? They're yeah. Getting to put the O and they just do CM. Next, next thing you know, that, that's right. Or it could be, let's say, it's a registered domain that's an exact replica of a company's name, but it's in .cm. You look at it, you get receive a phishing email from that, or you're a client or a customer or a partner of that corporation whose name was registered in .cm, and it looks a lot like .com. So, you know, you might, in fact, change, you know, the, the banking information to redirect an invoice for several million dollars to, uh, you know, a fraudster or something like that, you know, that's, this is how business email compromise starts, right? These mm -hmm. are these, these early stage indicators 
of uh, malicious cyber activity. It's not so, the uh, it's not the email from the prince in uh, Nigeria that needs. No, they've certainly yeah they they still exist to a certain extent right but uh, you know they they we've evolved from that. Yeah, but no. um, but Poor so what I've done was yeah that's right. So I have these crawlers that basically go out and look for for live data from all of these country codes that we're constantly scouring twenty four hours a day. Um, the, the global domain name system for this. And then the other component of this that goes well beyond brand protection is looking at subdomains. So for instance, you know, let's take a, you know, like CNN.com would be the domain name. A subdomain or a, a third level domain would be uh, an address that would be to the left of that. So let's say, you know, we have mail dot cnn.com that's a subdomain on top of cnn.com uh, and those subdomains are interesting because unlike domain names there is no legal authority to reclaim or take down a malicious subdomain very interesting for, yeah. yeah for the for the domain names <clears throat> themselves generally it depends on the top level domain that it's in like .com .net .org. Uh, they've all had to sign on to a dispute resolution process known as the UDRP or the Uniform Domain Name Resolution Policy. And you file essentially a, a legal complaint, which is like a mini arbitration uh, that happens all on the papers, usually in either Geneva with the World Intellectual Property Organization or in Minnesota with something called the Forum. They used to be known as the National Arbitration Forum. Now they go confusingly by the forum. Uh, and so you would file that generally the, the respondent uh, doesn't respond because he's a cyber squatter or he's a, some kind of cyber criminal. He doesn't want to raise his hand and say, hey, you know, I, I want my $6 back for that domain. Uh, and then you would you would win on merits as long as you make a prima facie case and establish you know, all that. But that's, that's an IP um, mechanism there. Um, and and also using that UDRP process, by the way, is something that could be very interesting for your listeners because there are ways in which I have figured out how to pierce the privacy proxies of domains by using the UDRP system. So getting behind who owns those domains. And then one of the other things that we can do is you know, th these can be somewhat expensive to to file because, you know, you're talking about uh, attorney time, even though not a huge amount of attorney time, but it's still a, a legal process and a complaint. But yeah. using this DNS data and the, the intelligence platform that I've created so that let's say there's a cyber incident it relates to a business email compromise scam, something like that. What I'm able to do with my platform is identify all these other instances of let's say trademark infringement of brand infringement that could relate to that particular incident as well um, and then tying together all of these other domains that are registered maybe around the same time maybe at different times but using dns data to tie them together i can make a common control assessment and then argue to the panel that <clears throat> instead of taking out and reclaiming one or two of these domains we should, in fact, be entitled to take over 40 or 50 of them at right. the same time. Right. And that makes it a lot more efficient and, and you get a lot more bang for your buck um, doing it that way. But so I, I was going on about subdomains and, and then somehow digressed into uh, the UDRP dispute resolution process. But the subdomain component of this, so if we go back to that, <clears throat> excuse me, that example of let's say mail.cnn.com now let's think about it differently let's think about if you register a domain name with that begins with com debt and then it's com dash session dash login is the e, uh, domain name that you register you go to godaddy today you can probably register com dash session dash login dot email because that's a new one of these new generic top level domains. Right. So we've got com dash session dash login dot email. We've got that registered. It's got a host. It's got an IP address. Now we want to create a subdomain on top of that. We only do that at the host level. There's no registrar. Uh, there's no GoDaddy. There's no nobody's, network nobody's solution. Yeah. yeah. It's just something called a DNS A record. You just basically create an A record on your host that says, here's a subdomain at this IP address that should resolve on the basis of this name. And let's say we make that, that subdomain Boeing. 
Then we just created a domain name whose URL is boeing.com-session-login.email. And you have just turned on your head all of that cybersecurity training that you've given your employees that tells them always look and make sure that you're on the real website that says .com, you're on boeing.com, you're on kroll.com, whatever it is, because you have just replicated using a subdomain, boeing.com. Right. That's crawl with a C, by the way. Yeah, that's right. That's crawl with a C. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) And, uh, And so that's very, very dangerous because this is where a lot of malicious and advanced cyber adversary activity has migrated towards is the use of subdomains on top of generic domains, because there are these brand protection systems that will alert companies when there's a trademark infringement. But if it's a generic domain that nobody's looking at and and nobody cares about when it's registered, then six months later or a year down the road, somebody creates a malicious subdomain on top of that and uses it to credential harvest your entity, which then leads to a ransomware attack. That's a big problem. And that's that's the the problem that that I have been uh, solving over the last couple of years with this DNS intelligence platform, because what I'm able to do is connect the dots between these malicious cyber adversaries, mm-hmm. figure out what the lowest common denominator of their activities are, and create essentially these digital dragnets where I can um, watch their moves. And whenever they activate new infrastructure or uh, create new infrastructure, I pick it up and then begin to monitor it. And that's okay, so how I picked up that that attack on the World Health Organization. Right. So let's segue over to that. So tell me what happened with that, and um, you know what what did it ultimately lead to? Sure. So this was this was interesting too because there was a group um, that's actually three years this month that I've been tracking one particular group of threat actors. They're very interesting. I would love to meet them in person one day because you know, <laughs> I, so I feel like I know them. I know what their interests are, their music tastes, all kinds right. of. But these guys have targeted over 1,700 entities in the United States, UK, Canada, and Australia, uh, the vast majority of which are in the United States and involved in, in what we would certainly consider to be critical infrastructure, whether it's defense contractors, heavy industry, chemical manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies, uh, huge amount of hospitals. They've targeted more hospitals and healthcare systems than anything else. But 1,700 is a, is a large target. And in creating that digital dragnet that I had described, I had also began to pick up other interesting activity in in the subdomain space. And that's what I've gotten really good at at finding and tracking. And I started to find another group that was targeting exclusively uh, IGOs or intergovernmental organizations, places like the United Nations, the World Food Program, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, anything that would be a major player in the, the sort of uh, the diplomatic space or uh, intergovernmental relations, you know, they're IGOs. And so I had been watching this group and again, figured out, you know, what their, their criteria were, the, the lowest common denominator of what their moves were in the domain name system and started tracking and tracing this, watching all of those domains, watching those subdomains. And then I'll, I'll never forget, I mean, it was March 13th, of 2020, when everything is going completely off the hook with respect to the coronavirus. Shelter, shelter in place, baby. Yep. Oh, shelter in place. It was totally insane. Yeah. Um, you know, things were getting really tense on the subway, riding the subway I, those days. I was on my way back from Destin, Florida, actually, I think oh, like the 13th or the 14th. God. Uh, I, you know, and I remember there... I, I was uh, got off at LaGuardia and I'm sitting in the terminal waiting to get my baggage. And this guy is like, I don't know, it's 10 or 15 feet away from me. And he's just hacking up along. I was like, cool. that, that dude's got Rona. <laughs> like I'm staying away from him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, look, if, if somebody sneezed on the subway, you know, you, you would be looking daggers at them, right? Right? I mean, it was, <laughs> it was a scary situation, you know, and, it, and you didn't see a lot of masks on, uh, you know, back then, you know, people were, um, uh, it, it was kind of scary to see people start wearing masks. I mean, if you think about it, and it was it was it was a weird situation. So, you know, things were going really, really haywire um, at that point. And sometimes you see uh, 
reverberations of older attacks in the DNS. Certain things will will re-up themselves, and it's kind of like throwing a stone into a pond, and you see those ripples farther away from the initial splash, which is the attack. And so the first thing that I did when I when I picked up this activity targeting the, the World Health Organization was go in and look at all of the records underlying it, make sure that it was a live attack and not something that had happened in the past. And uh, and boom, it was, in fact, a, a live state-sponsored attack on the World Health Organization on, on the 13th of March. And um, at that point, you know, I don't want to go into too much about you yeah, know, what no, the, no, what no, the we'll, chain of communications were, but I made the right noises. 35,000 feet, here we are. Yeah, we're yeah. we're made, running out of time, actually. Yeah, yeah we, made the appropriate noises to the right people. The attack was unsuccessful. Yeah. But I'll tell you, though, Matt, what's interesting, though, and this is from an investigator's perspective, I, I, I think – I think PIs will find this interesting. Is that so? Um, I didn't make the attribution for that attack. I believe it was Kaspersky that did. I try not to get into the world of attribution because if you get it right, you know, you can get yourself killed. You yes, get it wrong, <laughs> you can get yourself killed. So, from my perspective, I don't care who's behind it so long as I'm a couple steps ahead of it and I can block it for my clients. And you want to have but, coffee with these guys one day, apparently. I do. I, you know, I would love to have coffee with them because you know, I, I, you know, they, they certainly have. Uh, some pretty interesting skill sets. They're very, very good and effective at what they do. Sure. But um, what was fascinating to me is that, so Kaspersky had attributed this to a group by the name of Dark Hotel, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, supposedly associated with the government of South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing what was happening in South Korea at the time in March 2020, it, it would make sense that they were possibly targeting the World Health Organization. Um, they also targeted that same day a, uh, a local ISP in the Zurich area. So they were going after the personal accounts of the people that they were targeting at the World Health Organization as well. That's, that's what that indicated to me. But here's the really interesting thing. Uh, and this is what didn't make it to all of the media that surrounded the detection of this attack. And this is what concerns me more, is that this wasn't the first time this group of threat actors had targeted the WHO. This was about the sixth or the seventh time they had targeted the World Health Organization. So it's one thing to target an organization like the, the WHO when they're on high alert and there's a global health crisis uh, you know, a, about to go over the precipice. And it's another thing to target them when they're not on high alert, yeah. when it may be easier to get inside, when it may be uh, much uh, simpler to go and poke around and make lateral movements and establish some kind of persistence in those networks. It's right. those five or six instances prior that I think um, are almost more relevant to than that, that actual attack during the height of the coronavirus hysteria. Because if those, if there are aliens in those networks, that's what, you know, would keep me up at night. Yeah. But um, you know, I've, I've got a great relationship and we've become, I've become a good buddy uh, with the, the the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer of the the World Health Organization, as yeah. well. That's great. You know, listen, you've you've earned your keep. <laughs> you've shown your value. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> it. Um, so super interesting. We're going to wind down here, uh, but before we do, I, you know, I just want to uh, talk about you know another thing that occurred to me. You know, your product, this thing that you have here it's proactive, right? And it's not reactive. And I think that's, that's one of the number one problems in our industry is this culture of just being reactive to things and not being proactive to attacks like this. I mean, uh, listen, by the sixth time you're picking this stuff up, you know, maybe uh, by the fourth time or the third time you, you got to, if you were just paying a little better attention to things, right? Oh yeah. Um, so super yeah. interesting concept. Yeah, it, it really is. And it's a, and all of this data is out there. It's ripe for the plucking. And being able to identify the infrastructure that's going to be used to target you, either in a cyber attack or some kind of misinformation or disinformation campaign, yeah. getting ahead of it and neutralizing that before it even happens is, is absolutely critical. And that's where I think the, the, the cybersecurity, the practice of cybersecurity is really evolving towards this notion of we're not just defending the perimeter. We've really evolved from the concept of you know, we have a firewall and that's going to protect us to we need to go outside and hunt these threats, neutralize these threats before they actually begin to uh, affect the internal workings, the operations of our networks before they even hit the firewall. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's possible to to detect these things. Um, and I'll say another, you know, 
another operation, I guess, in which I'm involved is um, is also with uh, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, uh, through King's College London, and I, you know, I've had some uh, affiliations with them and and helped them out quite a bit through an MOU. We've also been providing data since uh, I would say about nine or 10 months ago about the vaccine rollout itself and monitoring a huge amount of terms in the, in the domain name system that relate to the pharmaceutical industry, that relate to palliative care, drugs under development, um, and, uh, and the vaccine itself to identify sources and channels of misinformation, fraud, abuse, and neutralizing those before they actually cause damage to that's the another show man come on yeah we're, we're it is time. Yeah. We can totally exactly talk about that. yeah uh, we'll, we'll have you on uh i don't know again sometime we'll talk about that stuff but yeah Absolutely. that's uh, that's that's crazy well the idea of tracking down attacks as opposed to reacting uh to attacks is a much more interesting movie uh, so yeah, well, <laughs> we'll yeah, that, that, that one absolutely. in development. <laughs> yeah, that's Alex, it. It's all about threat hunting, my man. Yeah, this was awesome, man. And if you're an investigator, you do investigative research, things like that. So the the reason that you you would contact someone like Alex, uh, cyberbullying, um, these uh, you know uh, corporate attacks um, where they're uh, doing brand you know brand assault essentially things of that nature. Obviously, you do what you can do on your end. But uh, Alex is a great resource uh, for understanding how to take it to that next step and what you need to do. And we'll make you look like a million bucks. That I can tell you. Uh, yeah, from personal that's right. Experience. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. And a lot of, you know, so, uh, cybersecurity incidents, if you have a client that's in the throes of an incident or they've been defrauded from something like a, a business email compromise scam, you know, we can certainly help you unwind that, capture additional evidence, figure out possibly even who's behind it. Yeah. So yeah, don't hesitate to be in touch. Yeah, and we're gonna put your contact information in the show notes great. and all that. Um, Alex, this was great. Uh, I can't wait to have you back on again because I really want to talk about that vaccination stuff because that's, uh, I mean, just yesterday I was reading something about how they're doing recalling uh, a vaccine in, in Asia because there's uh, particles of metal in it, right? Uh, oh God. So, so, yeah, it's just like a, the whole, whole another rabbit hole that I just don't want to go down right now. Um, oh, I, I agree. Let's do another show and I'll, I'll get some of the uh, DHS colleagues to join us yeah that'd be cool that'd be really cool so all right uh thank you everyone for tuning in i know we went a little over time today but uh, it definitely was warranted um and uh, we'll catch everybody on the next show next week take care everyone thank you everyone what an amazing episode alex is such a great interview you can be sure that he'll return soon we thank him for coming on and talking about these great topics. And we also want to thank Crosstracks, Merlin Locate, NCISS, Scope Now, Investigation Education Consultants, and the Campbell Insurance Group for sponsoring the show. So please support our great supporters. Now, have you checked out investigatorstoolbox.com yet? Now's the time to do it. Make sure you use code PIP201836 and save $20 when you join. And you can do just that through the app available on iOS and Android platforms. And if you have a question or comment about the show, just email Matt at MatthewS at SatellitePI.com. And you can find him on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. We want your feedback to bring you the best shows possible, and we'll return on Monday with a new show. So make sure you tune in and stay safe out there.